Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God. And let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this day. It is another new day that you have made, and we rejoice in it. Lord God, we continue now our study of the book or the letter that Peter wrote, the first letter that he wrote. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would continue to give me insight into this word, and we pray that you would anoint my tongue to declare it. Lord, we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. It has been four weeks since we last looked into 1 Peter. As the saying goes down here in South Texas, we've slept since then, and so we need to go briefly over what we'd learned in the past, so that we can get a a good segue into today's lesson. Well, Peter writes much of how believers in Christ Jesus are to live as children of God in the world that is steeped in sin. Having been cleansed with the precious blood of Jesus, Peter tells his readers not to return to their former ways of life, which were given solely to satisfy the lusts of the flesh. He is also clear that they may have to suffer as believers in Christ Jesus. He says this too is a precious thing since it reveals the genuineness of their faith, which is more precious than gold. Peter is very clear that if a believer in Christ is to suffer, it ought to be for righteousness sake and not for actually having committed some wrong. Suffering well after having done wrong doesn't win anybody any points. Suffering for righteousness' sake, on the other hand, does, is, a witness to other people because they know that the injustice has been done. Questions, of course, arose in us when we read Peter's words, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evil doers and for the praise of those who do good. And many of us thought, really, God? Really? You've got to be kidding. And God isn't kidding. Believers in Christ Jesus ought to be the best of the best citizens of every nation. What we did learn as we pondered this word is this. Though God's word is clear here, there may be times when kings and governors, and then let's you know, kind of include in there, presidents and legislatures will sign into law things which are contrary to God's word. Such a thing happened in Babylon uh, when Israel was in captivity there. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refused the king's order to bow down to the golden image that he had set up in the plains of Dura. And these men knew up front what it would cost them they would be thrown into the fiery furnace. Nevertheless, they chose to worship the Lord rather than the king's image. By law, the king had the right and the authority to judge these men guilty of breaking his law, and he had them thrown into the fiery furnace. God did spare their lives as a testimony to the king of God's power and might, but God is in no way obligated to spare everyone who disobeys the laws of a king, governor, president, or legislature. Okay? So there may come a time or times when we must choose choose to obey God rather than men. In these times, we must realize that the right to wield the sword does belong to those with the government, who have governmental authority over us. Now, surely it is my prayer that every single one of us will stand firm in the faith we have in Christ and with our voices and actions state with clarity under every circumstances we must obey God rather than men. The lives we live for Christ before others includes every part of our life. We can't compartmentalize our lives and say, this part belongs to Jesus and this part belongs somewhere else. No, the totality of our lives is what we live for Christ. We can't exempt any aspect of our lives, okay? 
in public or in private, at home or at work, how we live either brings God glory or it does not. Now we might have a boss that is seemingly intolerable. Nevertheless, we serve Christ over our boss, so how can we be a, a witness of our Lord even in less than ideal circumstances at work or any other place? Joseph was a very good example of this. He's a very good example of this. He was sold into slavery by his own brothers. Potiphar bought him on the auction block. He excelled as Potiphar's servant, but then was wrongly accused of sexual advances by Potiphar's wife because Joseph refused to sin against the Lord. And of course, Potiphar's wife lied to her husband, saying that Joseph had indeed made unwanted sexual advances toward her. And so Potiphar had him thrown into the Pharaoh's prison. Even in prison, though, he excelled because the Lord was with him. You know, what we see in the account of Joseph is how, he, how his excellent and his godly work ethic, living without complaint, even as a slave, gave him the admiration of both Potiphar and the keeper of the prison. He is definitely a person to be admired for how he chose to live when things weren't exactly going his way. He didn't know what God had in store for him. And we won't know what God has in store for us when trouble comes our way. We do know this. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the worst of times, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Continuing with the theme of how believers in Christ are to live as followers of Christ, Peter turns his attention to how wives and husbands are to live together. Beginning with verse 1 of chapter 3, and you have this in your bulletin, Peter writes, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Well, I read those two verses, and I can't help but think of the movie War Room when I read them. I, I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with the Kendrick Brothers film, War Room. I highly recommend it. Elizabeth Jordan, played by Priscilla Shire, is a real estate agent with a pretty self-absorbed husband. Their conversations are better described as fights, which usually get quite heated. And this was the way that her marriage was until Elizabeth meets a character called, her name was Clara Williams, who teaches Elizabeth how a woman should fight for their husband, not against him, but for him in prayer. That movie, War Room, I would highly recommend it. You can certainly rent it. But you can also borrow the copy. So, without having put a plug in for War Room because it fits today's readings, um, let me say that these verses, I think, need a bit of clarification. The word submission needs some explanation. Now, I don't know about you, okay, but typically when I see the word submission, I tend to, it, tend to move myself and my attitude it kind of seems like a demeaning kind of word. Y'all are kind of going, yeah, that doesn't look like a very friendly word to us. Um, you know, it seems to be demeaning, implies some kind of subservience. But this isn't necessarily so, okay? The word is more often translated as it is be subject to your husbands rather than be submissive to them. You know, that needs a little bit of more help too. Uh, so let's look into the Greek, okay? I did a lot of looking into the Greek this week. The Greek word that is translated in your passage there, your translation submission, but most do it subject, is the word hupotasso. A uh, couple of uses here. The Greek military term meaning to arrange troop divisions in a military fashion 
under the command of a leader. Okay, so you're, it's an arrangement. All right. In non-military use, it was a voluntary attitude of giving in, cooperating, assuming responsibility, and carrying a burden. It is a purposeful act of the will for the good of the marriage relationship and family. Now look at what Peter writes. He said, wives, likewise be subject to your own husband, that even if some do not obey the word, even if some are not believers in Christ Jesus, he says, that they without a word may be won to Christ by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Now, Peter has in mind here how a believing wife's attitude and actions within the marriage may very well influence her husband to come to faith in Christ. Okay, now that naturally would be wonderful, a wonderful thing to have happen and certainly one to pray for if the husband is not a believer. But why does Peter state his case for the woman's conduct with the words when they, meaning the husband, observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear? Once again, we need help understanding this portion of the passage. First of all, let me remind everybody that any translation of the Bible is an attempt by the translators to translate in our case, into English, what was originally written in a different language. Translators, they are hard-working and diligent people. The trouble, however, is oftentimes it is hard to convey in a different language what the original intent was of a particular word or passage. And since we aren't necessarily familiar with the nuances of a language or the context or the culture, of a people, we don't always fully understand what is being said. The text you have in front of you is from the New King James Version of the Bible, which is usually pretty good. However, this time the translators added the word accompanied. It's in italics in your text, okay? They added the word accompanied, which is not in the original Greek. And the word fear needs some additional explanation. The Greek word translated here as fear is the word phobos, okay? Which in its simplest translation is the word fear, phobos, you know, phobias, fear, okay? And you might think, well, pastor, why in the world are you making a big deal out of it if phobos equals fear? Well, because does phobos here mean shaking in your boots kind of fear? or something else, all right? Again, I did a lot of, I, I said here in my text, I, quite a bit of time was spent this week looking in Greek and you know, checking out lexicons and Greek dictionaries and so forth for the best fit of this, all right? You know, you might think phobos equals fear, that's a one-liner on a Greek lexicon. Not so. Two and a half columns later, <laughs> Two and a half columns later, you know, I was getting, you know. Uh, in the case of the word phobos, the better translation, which would give us English-speaking people a clearer meaning of verse 2, uh, would be the word reverence. Reverence. And so the text would be, wives likewise be subject to your own husbands, that even if some of them do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of your wives, when they see you conduct yourselves in reverence and discretion. That sounds better. And that actually is from the Aramaic Bible in plain English. So, so when he says, when they see you conduct your lives in reverence and discretion. Peter continues to speak to wives with these words, okay? Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. The words of verse 4 really touch my spirit. You know, there are some words added in this passage again in italics 
by the translators, um, but they don't take away from the Greek and they don't add to it. So in this case, it's okay. The point Peter makes is one actually we understand. Okay, Any person, man or woman, can make themselves look good on the outside. Okay? We can clean up pretty well on the outside. All right? But what actually counts is what the person is like on the inside. Okay? Nobody wants to be around a person if they are drop-dead gorgeous or amazingly handsome if they are in reality when the spotlight is not on them a mean and spiteful, horrible person. Peter tells us that the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit is very precious in the sight of God. He goes on to say, for in this manner in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves being subject to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abram, calling him Lord, whose daughter you are. And so he's speaking to these people. You know, he's not talking to Sarah, who's been long dead. He's speaking to these people, and he's talking to the women. He said, who's, you know, you are daughters of Sarah if you do good and are not afraid with any amazement, fearing any fear. So what does it mean? To be afraid of sudden alarms and panic, says George Ellicott, and he lived from 1819 to 1905. He says, to be afraid of sudden alarms and panics argues a lack of trust in God's providence and power and would therefore be unbecoming the daughters of Sarah, whose hope was in God. Okay? Let's make sure we notice something here that we could easily miss. Sarah's hope and trust was in God, not in Abraham. Okay? What did Abraham, I mean, what did Abraham do when he gets to Abimelech? Tell him you're my sister. Okay? You know, he's not a believer in God like we are. So, you know, tell him you're my sister. So what does Abimelech do? Takes him into, takes her, Sarah into his harem. What was Sarah thinking? You know, she's just doing what her husband told her to do. All right? She's trusting God is what she's doing. All right? So her trust and her hope was in God. She obeyed Abraham, but she trusted God. Let's not put our hope in any man, any person, male or female. Our hope has got to be in God. Now, Peter turns his attention to husbands. His sentence is long, so we'll need to pull it apart for better understanding. Peter writes, Husbands likewise dwell with them, meaning your wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Okay? Now, I would have no doubt in my mind that this particular verse would raise the anxiety level of feminists who would read it. <laughs> All right. Now, I don't know what it's like in other nations, but here in the United States, there's plenty of confusion regarding the sexes. Boys want to be identified as girls. Girls identify as boys. And boys are being told that they can have periods and get pregnant and have children. Not so. In the beginning, God made them male and female to be a complementary pair. The man's body is different from that of a woman's body. Right? And a woman's body is different from a man's body. There are some things a man can do that a woman can't do, primarily because his physical structure is made for strength instead of softness. Hence the word weaker vessel. Not, you know, not that a woman can't be physically strong or a man exhibit softness. It is simply to say that God intended the bodies of men and women to be different. All right. And though the woman's body may be the weaker vessel strength-wise, there's one thing a woman can do that a man cannot do, and that is bear children. 
and nourished them when they are young with her own body. Okay, a man can't do that. Those who say otherwise, they are messed up. And they need to get into God's word, learn the truth, and have their knowledge reset. Get back to the default settings, okay, that God put in there. In a marriage, the relationship between a husband and a wife is to be one where both honor each other as to the Lord. Paul's talked about it being, you know, submitting to one another. In other words, it's mutual, okay? So when I read, husbands likewise dwelling with them, your wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered, I interpret Peter's words to husbands to be, husbands, love your wives. Don't use or abuse them. Don't treat them harshly. Know their strengths and their weaknesses. Don't expect things of them that you know they cannot do and then complain when they meet your expectations. Treat them right. Both you and your wives are heirs together with Christ through faith in Jesus. Both of you are heirs of eternal life, not because of anything either one of you did, but because of what Jesus did for you. Now, did we catch the end of this particular verse? Did we catch the reason why Peter tells husbands? And I gather he's talking to believing husbands at this point. Did we catch why he says what he says? Why he tells them to treat their wives with honor and understanding? He tells them to treat their wives with understanding and honor so that their prayers may not be hindered. So that their prayers may not be hindered. How we treat other people, whether it's husbands and wives, or any of the other relationships that we have affect our praying. Do we want our prayers to get beyond the ceiling? Then our lives need to be free of any sins that might hinder them. Largely, this means that our lives need to be free of anger and bitterness and strife and jealousy and unforgiveness. Every one of these things creates a roadblock to our prayers. So let's get rid of them so that our prayers can reach the ear of God and we receive his response. You know, when we truly meditate upon what Peter writes here, he's saying, in a nutshell, show genuine deference to one another. And that word deference, some synonyms are respect. Show genuine respect, genuine esteem, genuine reverence and regard and admiration for other people. All right? Let's let the new creatures that we are in Christ Jesus be what motivates our actions and attitudes toward others. Amen. Amen.